as we all know, we're in the middle of a global pandemic and the world's focused right now on uh, fighting that pandemic, flattening curves, reducing suffering and so forth. That's exactly where our attention should be. And there are just a lot of people doing amazing work on our behalf for that task. But during Earth Week, it's fitting, I think, also to examine some of the connections between the pandemic and the global environment and our global socio-environmental system. So I think it's our job to be thinking about these broader issues, even as we support and applaud people that are fighting the immediate crisis, which is still happening. So our first step in doing that, doing that part of our job, was this idea, an online panel and symposium um, hosted here by the Gund Institute and pulling in people from across UVM. The other thing the Gund Institute has done is launched a rapid research fund to support new ideas in response to the uh, coronavirus pandemic. And we'll tell you a little bit more about that at the end, but just wanted to signal that here. So for today, we've got a wonderful lineup, people with a range of expertise across many dimensions of this crisis and its causes and consequences for the environment. Um, these people all agreed on very short notice to take part. Um, I'll introduce them really briefly as we go, but I also wanna say that there are many others at UVM and within the Gund Institute community with a lot of expertise on this. And I hope they jump in during discussion and they get involved in whatever work flows out of this. So let's get started. Our first speaker is Luz DeWitt. She is a postdoc in the Rubenstein School at UVM and a postdoctoral fellow at the Gund Institute. She is an expert in um, uh, zoonotic disease and the interface between conservation and environment and infectious disease. And she's going to get us started with that angle on this crisis. So I'll pass it over to Luz. Go ahead. Uh, thank you very much, Taylor. And thanks to everyone who's joining us today. Um, so I prepared this presentation to help everyone better understand the ecology of zoonotic diseases like COVID-19 and uh, better understand the environmental and socioeconomic factors that um, are associated with the emergence of diseases like this. And um, so zoonotic diseases are uh, caused by pathogens that are transmitted by animals. And to, get, um, to give you a, a better idea of how widely distributed they are, over 75% of all uh, pathogens that affect humans are actually sonotic. Um, spillover, which is a term that uh, we have all probably heard about a lot in the past four months, uh, occurs when a pathogen that normally infects um, an animal makes the jump and um, adapts to infecting humans. So we have pathogens like the virus that causes rabies, which is strictly transmitted by animals. So every single case of rabies in humans is a consequence of a direct interaction between an infected animal and a person. But then we have pathogens like, um, like HIV and COVID-19, that uh, originally were transmitted by animals, but are now adapted to become transmitted among people. So we can imagine that um, pathogens like these um, are more likely to be the source of, of outbreaks and pandemics like the one we're experiencing right now. And um, so spillover events are more likely to occur um, if the reservoir for the zoonotic pathogen is abundant. Uh, being abundant uh, increases the probability of contact with humans and with it, it increases the probability of pathogen transmission. Species that have expanded their ranges either because they are adapting to a changing climate or because they, are, um, they have been widely introduced are some of the most important um, reservoirs for zoonotic pathogens. Also, uh, sonotic reservoirs that are well adapted to human dominated landscapes are more likely to come in contact with humans and more likely to transmit sonotic diseases. Um, other factors that make spillover events more, more likely um, include land use conversions, particularly from 
um, natural habitats to anthropogenic habitats. And the mechanism is the same. Um, basically, they increase the likelihood of contact between uh, zoonotic reservoirs and humans. And then uh, wildlife poaching, whether um, it's for the wildlife pet trade or for bushmeat, it forces people to encroach into wildlife habitat and uh, increases the probability of contact with a reservoir for a zoonotic pathogen. And so bats are one of the most important reservoirs for zoonotic diseases. Um, they are reservoirs for rabies, for the Nipah, Marburg, and Hendra viruses. The reservoirs for Ebola, SARS, MERS, and COVID, which the last three are actually all coronaviruses. And um, something that has puzzled scientists a lot during the past uh, 10, 15 years is that all of these diseases, uh, except rabies, have very little to no impact on, on, popu on, on bat populations, making them really good reservoirs for zoonotic pathogens. And um, there are several hypotheses as to why bats are such good uh, reservoirs for zoonotic pathogens. Some include the fact that they are flying mammals. So because they are mammals, they are more likely to share pathogens with us than uh, birds or reptiles. Now, because they're mammals and they fly, um, they have evolved with certain, certain adaptations that allow them to cope with the energetics of flight. And this has resulted in uh, immunological uh, changes or immun immunological consequences that make them more likely to host more pathogens and um, and these pathogens tend to be more virulent for for us. Um, bats are also highly adapted to human dominated landscapes. They do really well in farms, uh, inside houses and uh, outside uh, city. Um, Bats are also uh, commonly sold as bushmeat in uh, wet markets, and I'll talk more about bushmeat in a little bit. Um, so most of the evidence points at, at um, COVID-19 originating from bats via um, an intermediary host, probably pangolins, in, in wet markets. And so knowing that um, the source of this pandemic and other pandemics and other outbreaks in the past can be linked to wildlife trade and bushmeat um, makes it tempting to uh, propose banning wildlife trade or banning bushmeat as, as, a, as, a, as one of the most straightforward solutions to uh, preventing pandemics like the ones with, like, like COVID-19. However, we have to uh, consider that wildlife trade and bushmeat consumption are an important source of income for a lot of um, households, particularly for women. It's one of the main sources of employment. And they're also the, um, one of the most important sources of protein for a lot of people that cannot afford to consume meat from domestic animals. And so in this slide, I've um, tried to summarize some of the consequences of wildlife trade and bushmeat consumption, regardless of whether they, um, th they are for or against, uh, against these activities. And so in terms of health, we know that there, are, um, there is morbidity and mortality associated to zoonotic diseases that originate from bushmeat. But we also have to consider that um, there is nutrition that, uh, or that bushmeat provides nutrition um, for a lot of communities. In terms of the environment, we know that both wildlife trade and bushmeat uh, create a, a heavy burden on wildlife species, particularly those that are endangered or that are threatened. But we also have to consider that um, if we were to, uh, to ban activities like, um, like bushmeat, um, a lot of land would have to be converted to sustain uh, conventional livestock practices. Um, 
Other social and cultural aspects that we need to consider is that bushmeat um, provides food security for a lot of households. It's an employment source for women, as I mentioned earlier. And in some cases, it is consumed because it provides social status. Now, in terms of, um, um, in, in economic terms, um, bushmeat hunting and wildlife, wildlife trade are important livelihoods um, for a lot of people. Uh, we also have to consider that for in many, in many cases, the cost of bushmeat is usually lower than the cost of, of meat from domestic animals. And I think most importantly, we have to consider that um, we have to consider all of the costs associated to pandemic, like the ones we are experiencing right now. And so, um, one of two, uh, two questions that I've um, that I would like to pose for the rest of the panelists and for for the audience in general is how can we prevent pandemics like COVID nineteen while sustaining people's livelihoods that depend on wildlife poaching, and what economic and nutritional alternatives to bushmeat can we propose? And um, with that, I would like to thank everyone and take your questions. Uh, and we're gonna actually hold the questions and have them accumulate in the Q&A section. And Steve and I, again, will curate that as time goes by. And then once everyone's spoken, we'll start bringing those forward to you guys and do a little curating again there. So the next uh, person speaking is Chris Danforth. He's in UVM's College of Engineering and Mathematical Sciences. He's also part of the Complex Systems Center here uh, in Vermont and a gun fellow. And he's gonna be talking about insights from big data and understanding the trajectory of this pandemic. Go ahead, Chris. Thanks, Taylor. Um... Glad to be here to chat about uh, what we're finding. So, uh, so our group works to take all the information that we post to the internet and try and understand aspects about our personality, our behavior, and, uh, and then population level understanding of, uh, of what's going on in the world. Um, so uh, I work in the Complex Systems Center here at UVM, and I'm gonna show you a few examples of the sorts of instruments that we build to try and understand uh, our behavior and, and uh, learn from, from the tweets. So, um, one of the projects that we've been uh, working on for a while now is trying to understand people's mental health from social media. So one of our recent um, studies looked at Instagram photos and found, for example, that uh, people who were formally diagnosed with depression or PTSD, there were aspects of their photos or their tweets uh, that were different from people who had never been diagnosed formally by a psychiatrist, and that those aspects were visible to algorithms that we worked on prior to the date that they were diagnosed. So this is uh, an active area of research for us. And another uh, area recently is looking at uh, the impact of visiting nature, spending time outside, in parks. So this is work by uh, one of our PhD students, Aaron Schwartz, showing that, for example, in San Francisco, people use uh, negative language less often when they're in parks, and the sentiment of the messages that they post uh, is roughly the same when they're in a park as the boost we get on Christmas. So these are a few examples uh, from the past. I'm going to show you some things now related to, uh, to COVID. So, uh, so every day, actually, there are about 500 million messages posted to Twitter. And uh, you know that's enough if we wrote them on post-its to wrap once around the Earth's equator uh, every day. So what you're looking at now is uh, an effort by one of our PhD students to decide what language these messages are in. And then there's a lot of emojis and really short texts. Um, so it's, it's quite a difficult problem, but this gives you a sense for, uh, for the scale. So this is over the last decade, we've had access, uh, elevated access to a random subsample of messages from Twitter. And uh, this is particularly interesting to us when we're trying to understand the global pandemic and whether language can be predictive of what's going on in, in places in the world where they're, they're testing for the virus is, uh, is poor. So one of our flagship instruments uh, that, that uh, we've worked on for a long time now is trying to understand how people are feeling around the world in as close to real time as possible. So this, is, uh, this instrument is called the Hedonometer and I'm just gonna toggle over to, to Chrome and show you a few things here. So, um, so you'll see, uh, this is again a, a, about 12 years now uh, you can see some, some sort of 
basic stuff. Saturdays tend to be happier. The weekends tend to be happier on, on Twitter. Um, Tuesdays tend to be the saddest day of the week. And uh, there was a regular, very regular weekly cycle for many years uh, with the weekends being happier. Um, and then uh, around the time of the election back in 2016, this sort of week, this weekly cycle sort of broke down. Um, but one thing that, that I'll say is that, um, you know, basically every event that takes place, whether it's a holiday or a death of a celebrity, a natural disaster, a terrorist attack, they, they tend to survive in this global sentiment for, uh, for roughly a day. And for the first time in, uh, in the history of the instrument, we see this uh, sustained um, dip in, in global sentiment associated with the pandemic. So you can see that down here on the bottom part of the screen. Um, it's, it's over a month now that, that the mood has been depressed, according to Twitter. Um, okay, so we have this uh, for, for several languages I mentioned. So this is a, a glimpse at what Spanish tweets look like over the last month, lots of negative words being used. And this is really important to try and understand as best we can how people are doing. We've done work to try and correlate this to other uh, more sensitive measurements of, of mood, let's say done by surveys. So, uh, so looking more specifically at, at what people have been talking about recently, here we're looking at um, six languages and the most common uh, phrases of length two, so two words in these, in these languages comparing uh, March of 2020 to March 2019. Um, so you can see uh, Joe Biden, for example, was uh, a phrase being used a lot in English uh, back in early March, less so a little bit recently. And, uh, and then, you know, you can see lots of sort of on Twitter, K-pop is really popular, so you see some of that stuff in Korean. And one of our goals here is to try and understand when we compare uh, two sets of, uh, of language, let's say like, like these two months, what are people talking about and what, what is it uh, predictive of? So here, for example, now we're looking at how commonly the word virus was used in the last several months. And, uh, and you can see, for example, that um, this is just looking at English tweets and the word virus, that there was a, a peak back in the end of January when the virus was, um, was being talked about in the news in, in China. And then for about six weeks, people just uh, stopped talking about it. And, and the decay uh, in attention was happening simultaneous to the virus spreading out around the world. Uh, the peak in usage um, happened uh, the few days after Tom Hanks and uh, the NBA cancellation. So uh, what we're trying to do is, is look across language and try and identify if there are patterns uh, around the world and how language is, is changing. And you can see here now that that sort of trimodal peak in attention for the word virus was common to, to several languages. Um, at the top of these, there's a sort of a balance of how much of the messages were retweets versus organic text that can matter for, for how things are spreading uh, through this information space. And then um, we're interested also in, you know, in, in words and phrases that indicate our behavioral response. And so there's sort of this initial phase where we're talking about the news of the pandemic and then trying to understand um, what, you know, what behavioral measures are people discussing and, and undergoing and what can we infer about that from their social media. So uh, it turns out that uh, roughly speaking, there were sort of two clusters of language. This is worked by one of our PhD students, Dave Dewhurst, two cluster, clusters of language in, in, um, in English and, and all the, the languages actually that we looked at. One of uh, sort of the blue curve here that's related to general language about the pandemic itself that, that started back in, in January. And then a second uh, cluster of words that surround this behavioral modification phase that we're in. Um, and uh, of interest to us, uh, it turns out that this, uh, this blue cluster of words in all of the countries that we looked at, uh, increased variance in this blue cluster turned out to be correlated really strongly with case counts in all of these countries. So if you look at, for example, um, let's see. So here we have uh, Turkish, Indonesian, Italian down here. This is the word for mask. And, and so each of these blue clusters in all of these languages, um, it turns out that about three weeks after that cluster peaked, um, or the, if you lag the case counts, um, if you lag the, the language cluster by three weeks, it correlates strongly with case, case counts. So this is the sort of thing we might imagine using in, in the context of hotspot detection in the fall. We try and look for language that seems to um, take off in communities, you know, as a leading indicator for, for where cases are growing. Uh, one last instrument, I've, I've mentioned a few that we're building. Uh, this one's looking at just trying to understand the, the churn of language every day. Um, you're looking on the right, this are, there's actually two histograms here. Um, and, and, uh, and so we're looking at Twitter in, uh, in March of 2020 versus March of 2019. Um, so all of these words, all this language pops out. There's so much happening every day in the world and on the internet. 
it's very hard to uh, to try and understand just looking at news articles or a few messages in your own Twitter feed uh, exactly what's going on. So so one of the things we're doing is trying to build instruments that can automatically understand and uh, the narratives that are being um, that are being told around the world by people about uh, events like this, and then try and turn it into useful information for us, whether it's helping us understand our own mental health or the benefits of spending time outside in nature, uh, or in, in the case of some of these applications, maybe trying to help areas of the world where the healthcare infrastructure isn't ready to do a lot of testing to see whether there's, there are linguistic um, predictors for case counts that we can, that could, we can leverage really cheaply. So, uh, so there's information about this, these projects at hedonometer.org. Uh, and our website, which I'll, I'll put into the uh, into the chat, and I'll just say thank you to Gun for funding, NSF, Mass Mutual, the Mitre Corporation, Peter Dodds, and I run this group together. And uh, thank you very much. I'm just going to very briefly keep introducing people. The next person up is Meredith Niles. Uh, she's in the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences here at UVM. Another Gun Fellow. Um, so we'll get her sharing her screen here and she's been already thinking about the impacts of the pandemic and our response to it on food security in our food system. So I'll let her take it away from there. Meredith, you ready? I'm ready. Thanks, Taylor. Hi, everyone. I'm watching the snow fall down up here in Lincoln, Vermont right now. So I don't know if it's uh, snowing down there, but up here in the mountains, it's snowing. Um, well, thanks for inviting me. And most of my work focuses on either understanding how farmers um, adapt to climate change and adopt other kinds of practices or the impact of climate change on food security. Uh, so this is a little bit of a, a new pivot for me into another type of extreme event and natural hazard, uh, this time being the coronavirus. So I'm gonna present um, some brief uh, new results from research that we've just rolled out um, since March. And I'm gonna to try to keep it to three key results that I think might be relevant for this community. And then also um, leave everyone with sort of a thought about how we might re-envision our food system in light of coronavirus. So I did want to acknowledge first to start um, that this work is part of a broader collaboration with researchers in the Department of Nutrition and Food Sciences, where I'm situated, as well as my research assistant, Thomas, and also with Johns Hopkins University Center for a Livable Future, Ronnie Neff and Aaron Beal. So all of their work has been really, really important to making sure that, um, that this has gone forward as quickly as it has. So I'll tell you a little bit about what we've done so far. Uh, but I wanted to start with a quote, and this is a quote from a respondent of our survey that went out across the state of Vermont um, over the last several weeks. And they said, going to be eating more dandelion greens than usual this spring, losing my job due to coronavirus has left me way more time for cooking. Having the time to spend, having the time to cook has allowed me to spend less money on food. And I think that this quote really highlights the complexity and the interaction of food and the environment and the current coronavirus situation and the economic situation that people are experiencing where this person might be spending more time outside, might be foraging more, but they're doing that potentially because they need to, because they've been disrupted by the coronavirus pandemic, because they've lost their job. Um, but they're also cooking more and connecting more with food. So I think the, the pandemic has really highlighted our food system as being fragile, but also incredibly complex. And, um, and all of those things are really interconnected. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about the survey that we did and a few of the results I'll be presenting from that. We sent out a, an online survey across the state of Vermont, and we did this uh, through four key recruitment tools, uh, Front Porch Forum, digital ads and social media, a number of community partners and state agencies and nonprofits and industry groups. And UVM also did a press release. Uh, and so we had a lot of media coverage driving people to the survey. We had the survey out for a total of two weeks between March 29th and April 11th. And across the state of Vermont, we received 3,251 total responses, which represents about a two percent margin of error and we were representative in our sample on age income and race but we were overrepresented in female respondents and highly educated um, individuals as well and in terms of what we've done to communicate these results yesterday we released the first round of uh, results they've been covered by uvm but you can also see all three of these briefs um, through my faculty homepage on the mfs website and gund institute has been tweeting about them as well 
So we had a general overview of our results about how Vermonters were being affected by coronavirus as it relates to food access and food security. We have a specific um, overview on respondents who are experiencing food insecurity and what their challenges look like, and then a specific brief on respondents who had lost their job or had a job disruption. And all of those have gone out to state agencies as well as all of our community partners, um, and it's being covered by the media as well right now. So I wanna leave you with uh, three key things that I think are coming out of our results and I think are relevant to think about social ecological systems and food systems moving forward after coronavirus. And the first is that this has really highlighted the fragility um, in our current system. So our results uh, find that there's been a 33% increase in food insecurity among our respondents um, since the coronavirus outbreak. And we, in our data, as well as, you know, everybody's probably observed this in their everyday lives, instances of people talking about hoarding, inability to find what people need as it relates to food, um, social safety net challenges for accessing food. And so what I'm showing here is the comparison between um, respondents in our survey who were classified as food secure versus food insecure and their experiences right now during the coronavirus and food access. And what you can see is there are really clear differences for people who are food insecure um, versus food secure. These are their perceptions, but generally speaking, people who are food insecure are having a harder time finding the kind of food that they need, um, not affording the food that they need, and especially having challenges with things like food pantries or knowing where to find help. And so I think our results really highlight that our current system um, was, was fragile and that that has really come to bear in this current context. The second thing I wanna share um, is that human nature is still at play. And this is a, a kind of question I ask a lot on surveys and it asks people to reflect on what they have done versus what they think other people have done. And generally speaking, as humans, we think other people are the problem. And we're not very good at recognizing ourselves as contributing to part of the problem. I think this is a really interesting finding for Gund in particular because it highlights a number of other studies that have shown this coming from some of our own Gund fellows. I'm thinking of a paper that Hilary Byerly and Brendan Fisher, among others, published a couple of years ago, finding that conservationists themselves are just as likely to be driving their cars and eating meat as other people are, for example. But here you can see, for example, that less than half of people said that their family bought more items in a single trip, but 88% of us think that other households are doing this. And uh, only 28% of our respondents said they were buying items that their household doesn't normally use, but 82% of us think other people are doing that. So there still seems to be a disconnect, I think, between um, how we recognize ourselves in contributing to some of these social and ecological problems. And then the third thing I'll leave you with is um, really what I'm calling a light on inequities. And our results really demonstrate that the coronavirus and especially the response has had a significant impact on people with unique vulnerabilities. So for example, we found that two thirds of our respondents um, who were experiencing food insecurity suffered a job loss or disruption. And that top figure there is showing you sorted on the type of job loss that people had, uh, whether they were classified as food secure or food insecure. So if you haven't lost your job, our rates for food insecurity actually track pretty closely to the state average. But if you have lost your job or experienced a furlough or a reduction in hours, you can see that the food insecurity rate goes up proportional to the impact that someone has had. And unfortunately, this seems to be potentially cyclical and related in the sense that um, people who are food insecure may be working in um, low income or low paying jobs. Um, they may be uh, less uh, able to work from home remotely, for example. And so they're disproportionately impacted by some of these responses. I also wanted to say that our respondents who were food insecure were more likely um, to be people of color, women, and low income. And then finally, I think it's really important, um, similar to what Chris was talking about with the mental health implications, that uh, we recognize that respondents who are food insecure are potentially having a, a hard time mentally in a way that others may not be. And so the bottom graphic here is really demonstrating the difference between our respondents who were experiencing food insecurity versus not, and their concerns and worries related to coronavirus. And you can see that they're 
really significantly different. So to conclude, what I would love for us to think about at Gund um, and more broadly are the opportunities for moving forward. This is a quote from one of our survey respondents that's really highlighting um, how we could rethink our systems, how we could invest in local food systems to be stronger and more resilient, and to use the crisis as an opportunity to transition people towards a different kind of food economy um, and how we can, we can do that moving forward. And so I think there's a lot of interesting opportunities and discussion that could happen and to think about what a food system would look like um, in light of COVID-19 and how GUND and GUND fellows and researchers could help envision that future. So thank you very much. So picking up on that last point of Meredith's about inequities is a perfect segue to Stephanie Seguino. She's in the economics department in the College of Arts and Sciences at UVM, also a GUND fellow and studies many dimensions of inequality um, diversity and inclusion uh, in environment and other sectors as well. And she's going to talk a little bit about uh, how that intersects with this current pandemic. Take it away, Stephanie. Um, thank you so much for organizing this. I'm going to uh, start talking first about sort of the macro level effects of COVID on humans. Um, one, of one of the effects, of course, is that unemployment is up and that means a significant decline in incomes for households. And it also means that things that we used to buy in the economy in order to have two adults or however many adults working in the economy, uh, we no longer can do. And so there's a significant increase in unpaid labor at home. Uh, many households have made life work in the last 25 years in which incomes have been stagnating by relying on family members to help support in terms of childcare and so forth. But Right now, between household assistance, for example, grandparents helping to take care of children is happening less. So more work is being done at home. There's also, uh, while there's maybe more time because of layoffs, there's also less assistance because of the inability of extended family to um, participate. More generally, what, this, what we are seeing is the increase in inequality and precarity. And I, I wanna say, I'm sitting here thinking that, you know, I have, I, I worked, um, uh, to research during the Asian financial crisis of 1998, the Great Recession of 2008, and today COVID. And all of these crises bear this same feature, which is disproportionately marginalized groups, people of color and women in particular, are most negatively hurt by these crises. They have less income. They tend to be in low wage jobs that don't have paid sick leave. Uh, they have few assets to smooth consumption over this period of time. Uh, and uh, as we're going to see when we talk about race, health, health intersects with this inequality. So in some ways, this crisis is, is no different and it's not surprising, but I'm hoping that the focus on uh, some of these aspects of the crisis will perhaps bring the attention needed to really address some of these inequalities. Um, let me, whoops. Right, go to the next slide. There we go. I want to just say just to say a couple of things about unemployment. Uh, every crisis has a widespread de destruction of jobs, and in this graph, you can see that uh, the 1930 here is the Great Depression, and over here in 2008 is the Great Recession. And this was as of last week. Uh, the unemployment rate was estimated to be around 13%. But uh, as of yesterday, a rough estimate, it's not an official figure, is that there's over 20% unemployment in the economy. I want to just talk a bit about uh, race uh, and, and COVID to give you a sense of how race is intersecting with the crisis. Uh, one of the things, that, one of the factors that is leading to, let me just get all of my uh, icons up here. Uh, that one of the things that we're seeing is not only Blacks, but also Hispanics have a much higher share of COVID deaths than they do of their share of the population. So for example, in Illinois, uh, Blacks are 14% of the population, they're 41% of COVID deaths. Same with Louisiana, significantly different. And Vermont uh, just started tracking race in its health reports every day. Uh, there's not enough data right now to say anything about that, but I have to say at least we are finally collecting data on race. Um, so there are a number of factors that lead to racial disparities in COVID. One, of course, is this phenomenon of weathering. 
and that is that black bodies and Hispanic bodies wear out faster than white bodies, largely because of the collective effects of racism. Uh, whether that is residential segrega segregation, leaving, living in space uh, communities without much green space, that are food deserts, that lead to chronic health diseases, uh, or, or also the behavior of medical personnel. A study just came out recently that showed that, um, uh, that looked at billings. And what they found is that equally sort of similarly uh, symptomatic blacks and whites uh, in the billing, blacks were recommended for testing much less frequently than whites. And so uh, uh, in addition to this, uh, rate, blacks are concentrated in a number of the jobs, A, that are essential workers and low paid, or B, workers that are laid off in the service sector, such as restaurants and the entertainment industry and so forth. So in many ways, a double whammy. They're crowded into those uh, the, into health occupations that put them at risk. They live in very frequently in crowded communities in which transmission rates are high. And at the same time, they're less likely to be able to keep their job or to telework. Uh, I just thought I would show you this graph. This is from the 2008 recession, if you see here. And already the black unemployment rate in, in, in normal times in the US has doubled the white unemployment rate and the Hispanic rate is significantly higher as well. Uh, and I'm anticipating with this, with this crisis that we're going to see uh, that if the national unemployment rate is around 20%, it would be even hard for me to predict how high the Black and Hispanic unemployment rate is going to go. The other um, major um, feature of this crisis is the impact on women, and in particular, women's uh, care work, whether it is in the paid economy, as healthcare workers, such as this nurse on the right who's fighting the coronavirus, the woman on the left who is a uh, cleans houses here in Burlington. This is part of a photographic project I'm doing to document COVID in Burlington. And, and so women are, are disproportionately relied on right now to do care work, whether it's paid or unpaid. Many families, because they cannot go out to eat, it means women are cooking more at home. They often provide the health care. They provide the homeschooling. Uh, and as you can see, they also are 69% of low workers. So those women who are continuing to work, often at great risk, also have low, the lowest wages without paid health care or paid sick leave. And so in general, what I would say is that this is a crisis of care. And, it, and previously, I think that, uh, that, that care work in the US, but also globally, has been treated very similarly to eco-services in terms of our understanding of economics and how our economies function. There is a sense, a sense that uh, this kind of work is free, that it is limitlessly available, and of course it is severely undervalued. Um, but today, you know, we can ask ourselves, who is it that is making the cloth masks? Who, it's, who is it that's doing the homeschooling and so on and so forth? And it, it, there's a disproportionate burden for women. One of the other gender effects I might mention is the reports that I'm hearing that, um, that in, uh, in the healthcare industry, doctors tend to be high up in the hierarchy and disproportionately male. And uh, in many places, including here at the hospital in Vermont, uh, in Burlington, there's a suggestion that nurses actually have less access to uh, PPE than do, for example, male healthcare workers who disproportionately are doctors. Um, I want to... Um, uh, just say a couple of words about the response to this, and that is that the, uh, the CARES Act, which is something like a $2 trillion bill, and many of you might, you know, many people might be sort of raise eyebrows at this. Of course, we really haven't, uh, we haven't disputed the need to spend this money, although I think that at some point soon there will be concerns about spending too much. Uh, and I just want to remind you all that the Trump tax cut a couple of years ago cost the U.S. economy $2.2 trillion. Um, I, I want to uh, just say a, a couple of things about what is missing in the CARES Act, and there will be some efforts to uh, provide some additional funding. Hopefully, there will be additional funding for people to cover their basic income needs, so a universal basic income, hopefully, throughout the rest of uh, this crisis will be forthcoming, although that will be difficult to achieve uh, in terms of the Republicans who are more inclined to support big business during this period of time, 
Uh, many of the uh, provisions of the CARES Act do not provide protection for immigrants, whether it is to the rebate or free COVID testing and a variety of other areas. So there are a number of uh, areas that have been left out of uh, the CARES Act that we will hopefully begin to see filled in. Um, so let me just end this with a few comments. One is that I, I haven't talked about developing countries. We, in some ways, despite the inequality in the US, we are in a significantly better position to, um, to face this because of higher incomes and more resources. For many years, the IMF and the World Bank have counseled developing countries uh, and even required developing countries to cut public health expenditures and have limited the size of government in those countries. And so that's going to be a major impediment going forward. What I'm hoping is that in general, that this is an opportunity for a rethink about how we structure our economy. You know, these fault lines were here before COVID. Uh, we have, the, the host body, if you will, has not been well even prior to this crisis. And so I'm hopeful that, you know, and well, I look forward to John Erickson's comments, but I'm hopeful that we can begin to, uh, to think about those kinds of alternatives that address these inequities. And you know, I've been doing this research for a long time, and in some ways, it, it uh, you know, it, it has been hard to get the attention on these issues that uh, is needed. But I'm hopeful that we can turn this, we can use this crisis as an opportunity to really focus on the issue of care, to focus on the fact that we are not on our own, uh, despite what some people would like to say, that we are very social beings, and the solution requires us to take care of social protection and in particular, take care of the most vulnerable. Thank you. Really, really interesting. Thanks a lot, Stephanie. And we have one more full speaker left, and then we'll have John Erickson do a bit of a um, discussion of all the talks. That last speaker before John comes on is Brendan Fisher. Brendan's a professor in the Rubenstein School for Environment and Natural Resources here at UVM. He's a gun fellow. He also leads the environment program here at UVM. And he's gonna, he's started several projects in response to COVID-19. And I think he's gonna talk about one that has to do with uh, sustainable development goals. So take it away, Brendan. Thank you. Um, I wanna start off with, with something on the kind of positive side of all of this. And, and it's not a positive side of, of COVID-19, but just a, a framing, um, a positive framing to get us into the work that uh, my colleague Robin Naidu and I have done over the past week or so. Um, here's a nighttime satellite image of the world as, as is. Seven percent of all people, of all homo sapiens who have ever lived are on the planet now. So seven percent of all people who ever lived are on the planet right now. This planet is we're right about we're right on the cusp of 7.8 billion people. We've got 195 countries recognized by the UN and about 197 million square miles of land. And sometimes we don't sit back and think about how big those numbers are um, and how complex the world is. And I want to say that I think one of the greatest successes that humankind has ever kind of bestowed in the universe has been the ratification of the sustainable development goals. 195 countries, 7.8 billion people represented, and the world came together to decide on these 17 goals to try to make the world a better place for people and for nature. So I think that is just an absolute incredible success. And it takes a global concert to try to meet these goals. And so my, co my colleague Robin Naidu and I, um, we were talking a few weeks ago and we were wondering, you know, how does this, how does COVID, how does this global pandemic affect the sustainable development goals? Um, COVID-19, we know billions of lives affected trillions of dollars in economic disruption potentially unmeasurable effects on mental and physical health for those 7.8 billion people. Um, and so we're, we're trying to think about what are the interactions here? How does COVID-19 and this global pandemic, how is it going to impact these sustainable development goals? 
So 17 sustainable development goals. That's what we hear a lot if, if you're in the kind of development world, 17 goals. Well, actually there's about 169 goals and targets. They each goal pictured here, no poverty, has a subset of targets underneath of it so that we can decide when we've reached that no poverty goal. And it kind of looks like this. This is only a portion of them and you're not meant to see the words on the screen here, um, but these are half of the individual goals that sit underneath those 17. So Robin and I had three questions. The first one is, is the target, so one of those 169 things there, is the sustainable development goal target threatened by the COVID-19 pandemic? We also wanted to ask if that target had already been met, if we had met that years ago and reduced that need, would it have reduced the severity of the impacts that COVID-19 has bestowed upon the world? And if that target had already been met, would it in fact have increased the severity of these impacts? So those were our three questions. And I want to, um, before I, oh, my screen, this was really a thought experiment. So this isn't um, a survey of 3,000 experts. It's not, um, it's not a super complex uh, approach to the question, but we did it as a thought experiment to try to figure out what we could learn from it, just the two of us thinking about these things with the thought that maybe we could get it out there and, and engage more people in it, but really just as an experiment to say, okay, this interaction here, what does it mean? Are there any lessons we can learn across that? Hmm. Seeing that I've lost the ability to forward my slide. Here we are. So, Here's our results. And again, I'm gonna put them in quotes because this was more of a thought experiment. So is the SDD target threatened by COVID-19? Well, we guess about 97 to 124 of the 169 targets. So some around 60 some percent of those targets were threatened by this global pandemic. They mostly fell into these SDG categories. So um, no poverty, the infrastructure, quality education, uh, life on land, decent work and economic growth, and sustainable cities. So the targets that sit underneath those six goals are severely threatened by what we're seeing now globally with, with COVID-19. So if we had met the target, would it have reduced the severity of these impacts? And we estimated that only 69 to 87% of these targets, so about 45%, would have mitigated the negative effects of COVID-19. So what is that saying? That's saying if that in 2030, we have met all of these goals, only a few of them would have mitigated this pernicious effects of a global pandemic. So clearly, if we had met goal number one, no poverty, we'd have mitigated some negative effects like the ones that Stephanie mentioned in her presentation previous to this. Clearly, if good health and well-being, the targets underneath there um, were met, we would mitigate some of the effects of COVID-19. And clear, clean sanitation, water, reduced inequalities. And this third, this number 13 is climate change. So, and our final question was, if the target had already been met, would it have increased the severity of these impacts? And again, this is a guesstimate, but up to about 22 of the targets, about 13% could have made the negative effects of COVID worse. And I'll talk about that in just a moment. And this one actually. So here was our question is, how do the sustainable development goals um, and COVID interact? And we suggested that if we were to meet the sustainable development goals, what that means is about 20% of the targets in the sustainable development goals, they accelerate physical interaction among the world's people. About 16% of those targets increase the scale of the economy and about 18% increase the size of the global population. Again, these are just rough estimates. All three of those things are factors that have been associated with global pandemic outbreaks. So by meeting some of these targets, we actually might make the transmission of the negative impacts on COVID-19 even worse. So what does all this mean? Well, maybe, again, and this is where I'd love further discussion, both in the discussion here, but also emails or reaching out. Um, maybe what that means is that 
if we think about the fact that the SDGs were developed in normal times, um, that should help us think about um, how relevant they are to non-normal times. And so our analysis suggests that in non-normal times, our ability to achieve these SDGs is severely limited. Um, and that even if we did achieve them, it might not have positioned us especially well to counter the pandemic's most pernicious effects. So the, I guess the question I'll throw out there is that do we need to re-envision some of the global goals in light of COVID and future pandemics? And I think I'm just going to offer one, one thought on that. Um, about two weeks into the pandemic stay at home orders across the world, I sent out a, a, a survey, an, an email survey to my friends who live in, in China and across Europe and across the United States, just asking them, you know, how this has affected their lives, just trying to check in with a lot of people. And on the work side, so many of my colleagues decided to revert, to change what they were doing, to strip away some of the research projects they were undertaking and refocus on things that could really um, maybe move the dial or mitigate the negative effects of global pandemics, of biodiversity loss, of climate change. So really to reprioritize the way they were spending their time. Taylor and the rest of the gun, thank you very much, Steve, for reorienting to have this meeting just today. We're in a time of need and tons, there's 200 people online right now, have reoriented to see how our work and our interests interact with such a thing. And so if on a personal level we are reorienting, maybe we do need to think about um, some of our global goals in light of the pandemic and reorient so that we, um, so that the goals we meet and the way we mobilize society actually will increase the ability for the kind of the world's poorest and the rest of the world to meet sustainable development goals, but that are more resilient to global pandemics and future pandemics. So I'll leave you with that question. Do we need a re-envisioning? Awesome. Thanks a lot, Brendan. Thanks to all <clears throat> speakers. Uh, now we're going to give five minutes to John Erickson to you know, really simple task, synthesize across all 50 minutes, say what we all should be thinking and doing going forward. So go ahead, John, we're all waiting for your answer there. Uh, all right, well, thank you. Uh, this was a fabulous lineup of speakers. Thank you, Taylor and the Gund Institute for pulling this together. Yeah, my own impression, and I've been thinking a lot about the word resilience in response to the COVID-19 crisis. Um, you know, our societies, our economies, our communities, our families, our individual selves ability to bounce back right from a crisis. And I think resilience really cuts through all the talks here uh, in a really important way. And, and I, I love the fact that Luz really started with the big question of lessons for the future. So maybe I'll frame it around that. Like what are the lessons for the future to create a more resilient, not a less resilient uh, economy, community, society at the other end of this? Um, so the resilience theme really struck me sort of three, three pieces of the puzzle that were discussed. Um, one is this importance of thinking more than ever about our connectivity. Uh, two is to think about uh, adaptation, the ability to adapt and take in new information and new ideas, new thought systems to adapt to uh, change. And three would be what we do really well at the Gun Institute is to analyze patterns and processes, to think about connectivity, adaptation, ultimately to get back to the lessons of the future. So starting with connectivity, um, Luz talked about zoonotic disease uh, and zoonosis and the interactions between our landscapes and our, our settlements and interactions between ecological systems and human systems and how we're all connected. Uh, I think this is something we, we talk about a lot in hallway chats at the Gund Institute, but perhaps the world is waking up to how indeed connected we are. Chris on our connectivity and how that can be measured in social media. Um, you know, the fact that we are apart, but still connected uh, in, in many ways more, more than ever. Uh, Meredith on thinking about the connectivities of our global supply chain and when they break, <laughs> Uh, how obvious it is that that global supply chain has some key vulnerabilities and how we might need to think about reconnecting to local and regional food systems. Uh, Stephanie on the macroeconomic connections, um, unpaid work at home, essential work, really realization of what is at the foundation of our economy. 
And Brendan, of course, getting us to think big picture that 7% of all humans ever alive on this planet are here with us now and what the would look like and the connectivity amongst the SDG framework. Um, the second theme that kind of cut through all this for me was adaptation. So the challenge that, that Luz brought up of, of really adapting our human systems and the challenge of things like, uh, like the bushmeat trade and, and, and bushmeat in adapting um, to very vulnerable communities who are often co living quite at the edges uh, that have to make decisions that uh, affect uh, the global health system. Um, adaptation and analysis of our language. I mean, I love listening to Chris's examples of, of measuring global sen sentiment and using that information to kind of create early warning systems so that we could adapt to these kinds of crises in the future. Meredith, of, of course, on food systems adaptation um, and that human nature is really at play here, right? That's the big part of my takeaway from her talk uh, and that we have these kind of various behavioral lock-ins that we really need to be aware of as we push for greater adaptation of our human systems. Um, Stephanie bringing into focus the challenges of our vulnerable communities, uh, the lack of assets, access, the lack of assets and their inability very often to adapt to crisis. And then Brendan, of course, on interactions with the SDGs and COVID-19 and this question of if we had met the SDGs before, would we be in a better or worse situation? So then the last piece is patterns and processes. Uh, Chris's analysis of Twitter patterns and processes, Luz's analysis of human animal interfaces and those patterns and processes, Meredith's analysis of our current food systems and kind of its current makeup and its vulnerability through analysis, analyzing its in real time, its patterns and processes. Stephanie thinking about marginalized groups and how they are most vulnerable to crises and racial disparities and unemployment rates and the impact on women. And Brendan, this big grand thought experiment on the SDGs and, and the fact that by their assessment, two thirds of the targets are threatened currently by COVID-19. So in the last 10 seconds, lessons for the future. I hope we can discuss this more. Um, you know, from Luz, front lines are often the populations on the edge. From Chris, early warning systems are possible from the big data analysis that we do. From Meredith, we have to really lean into our local regional food systems and really think about the inequities of that current globalized system and how we could fight those in a more resilient local food system. Um, Stephanie, we have to finally take inequity seriously. We keep coming back to this crisis after crisis after crisis and her notion of a crisis of care, I think is so relevant to the lessons for the future. And then finally, Brendan, will the SDG framework negotiated by 190 plus countries, which is an amazing feat, will it hold up? Will it be weakened by this? Will we end up doubling down on this? Or do we have to really develop something that in these non-normal times that can really hold up to something that was negotiated in quote unquote normal times. So that's my best attempt, Taylor. This is a tough assignment to, to uh, connect the dots here across, across the speakers. So thank you all very much. I learned a ton. So, so good. Thanks, John. I, I got to admit, I was scrambling to like read the Q&A questions. And so I'm definitely going to go back and listen to that recording again, because that's a nice list of things we can actually pursue together in small groups and among many of us to kind of answer those future questions. So I love it. Okay. I am going to do my best to sample fairly from the 20 so far questions that have uh, uh, come up, more than 20 now. Um, and I'm going to start by going back to the beginning, um, just because, you know, um, a lot of this is going to be about prevention and understanding what predicts jumps of zoonotic disease from other populations to ours. And there's a lot of ecology in there. In fact, that is essentially ecology. So I'm going to start with loose, um, first of all, I'll give you a chance because several people asked if you could talk about, um, what bushmeat actually is, and also um, what do you mean by poaching? Is all harvest of bushmeat and traded wildlife poaching that is illegal, or is it? Um, are there kind of more accepted and legal ways that people eat wild meat from nature? So I'll just let you sort of like clear that up, and then the the question I want to convey to you is a really big picture one about how 
you know, economic forces are driving more deforestation and more encroachment of us into tropical areas. And to what extent do you think, you know, estimating the potential health impacts and costs of that through the likelihood of pandemics um, offsets the upsides economic of doing that? So the way they worded it is how might the health impacts of this encroachment into nature um, be used or estimated as an argument perhaps against doing that so much or at least as to make clear the trade-offs of doing so. So I hope that was clear, like a quick clear up thing and then that big picture about the trade-offs between encroachment and the risk of disease. Sure. So bushmeat is just basically meat that comes from wildlife species. And not all bushmeat is illegal, so not all bushmeat is considered wildlife poaching, but several species that are uh, consumed as bushmeat are illegal and are considered as poaching. So um, if at some point I uh, talked about both as, as equal, then um, sorry about that, but it, um, some bushmeat uh, is considered as poaching. And then the other big picture question, I think um, I think it's a, it's a very difficult one. I, it's a matter of who is going to be the winner and who's going to be the, the loser. And um, there are a lot of costs associated to this pandemic, um, health and economic and social. And, um, but there are also uh, costs to uh, maybe a smaller group of people or communities um, that sustain um, activities that encroach into wildlife habitat or that um, uh, induce or that are associated to wildlife poaching or to bushmeat consumption. So um, one of the things that Taylor and hopefully Brendan uh, as well, uh, we're going to probably be doing is um, a cost benefit analysis, considering all of the costs and benefits of uh, wildlife trade and bushmeat consumption. Great, okay. So a question I see uh, for Meredith is whether or not you in included or can measure effects on um, immigrant populations specifically and do you know if they differ in their impacts and the impacts on them from COVID-19 in terms of food security and even if you I'll just add even if you don't have the data what do you suspect and what do you think might be the case? Great thanks for that question. Um, so we don't have a specific measure in our data about whether or not someone is a new American um, or sort of their immigration status. We do have questions in the survey about race and ethnicity. And as I indicated, um, we did find that um, people of color were more likely to have um, have experienced um, higher rates of food insecurity. I don't want to equate that necessarily with a, a a new American or um, immigrant population, but we could look at some of our data related to some of those demographic characteristics a little bit more carefully to try to see some of that. What I will say is that our research team, um, this is not the first survey uh, or the only survey that we're going to do. We are planning to, first of all, do a nationally representative survey that will hopefully go out next week uh, in collaboration with Johns Hopkins. And then we're also planning to resurvey people here in Vermont and to continue this work here in Vermont but also with researchers across the country and other states. And so we're in a lot of collaborations right now to replicate this study in other places. So I will definitely think about adding that question more explicitly. Um, and I, what I will also say is that um, we are working, especially here in Vermont, to understand how we can uh, reach people with our next round of surveys who may not be able to respond to an internet or online survey. And so we recognize that that may have hindered some people to participate. Um, and so there's definitely some potential outreach that we're gonna be doing with community partners that work with uh, immigrant populations among other people in Vermont who may not be able to access an online survey. So thank you for that question. And we will definitely think about that for future iterations. Great. Um, okay, 
So here's another one that caught my eye. I'll just keep moving through these. Um, uh, where is it? Right. Okay. Um, so this is a this is prompted by uh, Brendan's talk on sustainable development goals, but I think it might be a broader one. So feel free to have others jump in after Brendan if you like. Um, in a time where the economy is weakening and oil is being, um, you know, is worth less than a dollar, or I think the price has gone negative in some markets, is now a good time to try to rebuild the economy with clean energy. That's one question. And um, uh, I think I brought, no, no, we'll stop with that one and I'll broaden it next. So is now a good time to look to restructure economy, especially around energy. Don't forget to unmute yourself. Uh, yep, yeah. got me. So I saw that question come in and I am going to completely bounce past that to John Erickson, who is certainly, if I had that question in my head, the first person I would call would be John Erickson. So I would feel totally ashamed if I even tried to answer that in his presence. So John, I'm sorry to throw you under the bus, but that's all right. That's all right. you're my guru in this. <laughs> well, yes, yeah, as, as a discussant, I guess I, I, I can jump in if, <laughs> if, if called upon by a panelist. Um, yeah, I, I've been giving this a lot of thought. I mean, the, the challenge right now is that we 85% of the world's energy comes from fossil fuels. Um, so we have a huge path dependency. Um, whole sectors of the economy uh, have workers in, 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 in towns and, and even states in the case of the United States that are dependent on fossil fuels. So it's a question of pace, right? Um, I'm not a big fan of bailing out the fossil fuels companies, which is going to happen at these low prices. Um, all of this new exploration that has happened um, through fracking, through deep sea oil, uh, through pipelines, through further and further exploration uh, can only be done at uh, oil, oil, oil prices really north of $50 a barrel. The reason that a lot of it continues to happen at 20 or 10 or $15 a barrel is because of huge energy subsidies. Um, so without the subsidies and with these cheap oil prices, the writing's on the wall in terms of huge fossil fuel bailouts. Um, I think we have to be thinking about the bailouts as transition, right? How do we use money to help transition, especially the workforce in a fossil fuel econ economy to a renewable energy workforce? Um, a, a lot of thought has been put into this in recent years so that we're not just letting the vagaries of the market leave a lot of people behind in fossil fuel communities and in fossil fuel jobs. But ultimately, it has to be an approach of bailing out the people and the workers and not the companies. Uh, they have made record profits for years and years and years and have decided not to invest those rock record profits into becoming an energy company, not just a fossil fuel company. And that's unfortunate, but I think it's too late to go back. I could go on for hours. I'll stop there. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I admire your restraint in doing so. That's a really, really big question. All right, I'm gonna to toss it to Stephanie. I'll come back to when it's actually for you, Brendan, so you're not off the hook entirely. Um, I'm gonna uh, pitch it to Stephanie about um, um, whether you have thoughts on how we can restructure our economic system to consider care work within families as equal to more traditional workforce labor kind of prompted by this, like many things are being prompted by, the brighter light being shown on that uh, by this uh, crisis. Sure. So uh, just one thought for all of you, and that is that uh, GDP only counts market goods and services. And so we're gonna see a decline in GDP, uh, but it's not gonna reflect the shift of work from the market to the home. And that's been the problem uh, that care work has been invisible for a long period of time. So just a, just a thought for you to think about interpreting uh, those data when you see them. So I think, I, I think this is a moment for, you know, th those of us who've been feminist economists that have been studying this for 25 years, this is a moment. And so thank you for that question, um, 
with regard to care work. So I think, you know, important things are to work, uh, work family accommodations, right? So when we do return to work, acknowledging that there's a lot of care work to be done at home. So that might mean paid sick leave. It might mean paid parental leave that incentivizes men to also participate in this work, for example. Uh, it also means valuing, actually valuing the work that uh, care workers give, whether it is people that clean your house, whether it is the woman that I showed you in the photograph who's cleaning buildings, whether it is home health aides who are pitifully paid, um, it, that we need to restructure, we need to revalue that in the workplace and we need to support people to provide that work at home. And I think, you know, a lot of it is about, about focusing on this as a priority. Uh, and I hope that this crisis helps us recognize that we are deeply social beings. Care is fundamental to human, human life. And uh, so I think it is more of a question of politically prioritizing this type of work uh, in the future because, you know, there are countries that have done much better at this than we have, and certainly all of us can do better at it. But just to remind you, the caring professions are the least paid in our economy. And uh, professions that, you know, one might think of as not particularly helpful, such as stock trading, uh, are some of the highest paid. So part of it is us recognizing that a market system does not appropriately value various types of work. It either overpays certain types of work and it underpays other types of work, which is you know, highly correlated with gender and highly correlated with, uh, with race. Really great. Okay, so now I'm going to try to actually pin Brendan down with a question. And my favorite that, that focused on him was uh, turning his wide open question at the end right back on him, um, saying, should we, you know, rethink the sustainable development goals in light of this pandemic? And this person wants to know what your thoughts are on that. Do you think we should? I don't know. That's why I asked the ethernet here. Um, you know, I think that anytime we make a decision, we, we decide we're going to do this thing and we make that decision within a context of the state of the world, whether it be the state of our house or our physical health or whatever it is, we decide to do something given the information and the context that we're in. If that context drastically changes and we stick with the same path, it's unlikely that it's going to have the same outcome. And so I think we do that all the time. We re-envision, we change, we, um, we adapt to changing circumstances and don't stick to the blueprint that we might have had for ourselves in things as simple as my vacation this year or what sports I'm going to play or anything like that. When the context completely changes, we need to, re we need to adapt. And so with that in mind, I would say, I think we do need to rethink some of the goals or reprioritize some of them. One of the big critiques of the sustainable development goals when they came out um, was, a, was a, a piece in The Economist and, and it said the 169 goals that may make the world worse off, something like that. The Millennium Development Goals, there were eight goals and um, the globe came together to decide on those goals and did a pretty good job of we made a lot of progress towards those with global coordination. Um, and now we have 169 targets and we probably can't do all of that as a global collective in the time frame that was estimated 2030. Um, and so I guess that's a long rambling answer to if not re-envisioning the sustainable development goals, then at least maybe reprioritizing those that meet the most fundamental needs and demands of the people across the globe that are marginalized or our ecosystems and biodiversity, and at the same time, make us more resilient to a world where many people think we'll have more pandemics and drastic um, cataclysmic events, whether they be from climate change driven or from further you know, future zoonoses disease or even geopolitical problems. So I would say at least reorienting on the ones that deliver on the basic fundamentals for the SDGs and make us more resilient to some other things that come down the pipe. That was a big wide open question. Anybody else want to chime in from the panel on that? <laughs> Uh, 
Okay. That's Brendan's simple. answer will be the answer then for now. Uh, I want to go very back to the beginning again, um, pick on Luce a little more about the origins of this uh, pandemic and ones like it. Um, there's a few questions that all kind of combine. One was, you know, there have been wet markets and things like it forever for a long time um, and entire livelihoods built up around them, but they've been active for decades. Um, why do you think this jump happened now? Um, and are we going to be ever be able to predict kind of when a jump like this happens? Um, then the last element of that is, is climate change changing in your mind the likelihood of jumps happening via markets, if that's how it happened, or in general? Right, yeah, okay. Um, these jumps have been occurring um, for a long time. Um, there are actually a lot of studies that have shown that people living close to bat caves or that visit bat, bat caves are actually, actually have antibodies against, uh, against some of these coronaviruses. I think one of the reasons why this coronavirus had not the jump, but the impact it's having and it's um, as, as a pandemic is because of globalization. Um, just the interconnectedness between uh, countries just made it really easy for the for infected people to move around the, the, the world. Also, um, this virus is just really good at being transmitted. And um, probably, who knows, um, there are a lot of, there are a lot of, um, there's a lot of research showing that, um, that actually had predicted that the next pandemic was either gonna be an influenza or it was gonna be a coronavirus. So those predictions are there and they have been there for a little bit. And um, we could, uh, there, there's evidence that we can predict where, uh, where the next uh, jumps will occur. Whether we do something about it depends on, on um, enforcement of um, like what we do about, about wet markets or about um, bushmeat uh, hunting and things like that. And um, the other question was about climate change, right? Yep. Um, my, the, right now, the only thing that comes to mind, the connection between uh, climate change and uh, spillover events in terms of uh, bushmeat consumption would be, um, it would be related to range expansion of certain species that are reservoirs for zoonotic pathogens. So range expansion um, in response to climate change or some pathogens that, um, that have an environmental phase that does better under certain climatic conditions, like more wet or more um, warm uh, conditions. Um, so that would be my, the only uh, connection that, that I make with, between climate change and, and spillover events of this kind. Yeah. Great. Okay, so I plan two more questions um, so that we can end on time here. And I'll remind everybody that there's this open Q&A window. We've been moving through them as they get answered. Several speakers are answering questions to them in type. Um, and we are going to try to capture all the ones we didn't even get to so that we can find some way of having speakers um, answer them even if we run out of time. So I have one question for Chris, trying to connect what he's able to do with big data with one of the themes of this session. And that is whether he thinks, do you think, Chris, that you can um, shed light on some of the inequalities that Luce and Stephanie and Chris, not Chris, uh, John, have um, highlighted? Can your instruments pick that up and help us understand how um, happiness or response um, to this crisis differs among groups, whether it's along among racial groups or among income groups or age groups? Do you have that ability? Yeah, it, it's a great question. Uh, I think there have been some articles in the past few weeks looking at how um, mobility changes 
uh, you know, were visible differentially between zip codes based on income, for example. And, you know, it's very likely that our language will, will, um, will do, will, will demonstrate similar patterns. So this is probably a month ago now when people started to, to move around less, um, you know, wealthier communities were able to do so, you know, three, four days before um, communities where people were less well off. And that, you know, that trend will be visible all over the country and, and all over the world. And I, I think the data that we have um, associated with language change, you know, what, what we would try and do is understand what, you know, what people are expressing emotionally, um, you know, what changes are in their, in their state of mind. Um, are there differences in access to recreation and nature that, that intersect here? Some people are spending more time outside than they ever have, and some people are locked up in their house. Um, so I do think that we'll be able to answer some of those questions at the, at the population scale. Yeah. Great. Uh, I think a lot of this could really use that kind of um, data set. Okay, so here's the kind of wrap up question that draws from some of the ones I'm reading. Um, but kind of reformulates it by me, frankly. And that is, I'd like each of the speakers to, in a minute, please take turns and say what you hope changes about uh, the world, frankly, our sort of social and environmental systems, and especially our linked socio-environmental systems. Amid all this suffering and anxiety and pandemic, what do you hope um, the world and our global society um, comes out of this having improved about itself. Um, and if you can add quickly, how can we as scholars help make that happen or inform that shift? So I'm going to start right back with Chris Danforth because that's who I'm looking at. Yeah, I think it's a great question. Um, you know, I, I, our group, you know, we're, we're interested in, uh, and trying to quantify stories that people are telling. And I think we're all ready to hear some stories about how people are helping each other. And um, I think that, you know, from my perspective, if, if our own work could bring about uh, a better mechanism to identify, you know, what, what good things are happening in the world and, uh, and how to encourage people to help each other uh, using, you know, this, these computers we're carrying around with us, they, they're really, uh, they're not that great for us as individuals, but um, maybe they could help us if they could tell us to go outside a little more or, um, or call our loved ones. Uh, you know, I think that our phones are a part of this surveillance economy. And if anything uh, that comes out of this, that would be good if we could turn that uh, information into something useful, that would be great. Sorry, beautifully done. I'm gonna to go to Meredith next. And then for the speaker's benefit, we're gonna go through the speaker list in the same order. So Meredith, then Stephanie, then Brendan, then John, then Luce at the very end. So Meredith, you're up. Thanks, Taylor. I was just jotting some notes down here. Um, one of the things I hope comes out of this is that we will, as a society, come closer together and recognize that we need each other and we exist in society and that's a good thing. I will share one positive thing that came out of our survey. We found a doubling in the percentage of people that indicated that their food was delivered to them by friends or family or other people since the coronavirus. And so we have clear evidence that Vermonters are helping each other, um, especially those who may be most vulnerable. And I hope, hope that we come out of this recognizing that we are a society and that we um, should all be a little humble about the contributions that we make to, to some of these challenges and think about the ways that we, that we behave. Um, I think the other thing I hope is that people come out of this with a, a renewed sense of appreciation for food, which sounds really uh, simple, but especially in the United States where food is uh, much cheaper than in most other countries and very abundant, I think that we have been disconnected from food for a long time. And I hope that um, we will recognize that it is um, something not to be taken for granted and that we can all reconnect and have a role to play in our food system. Fantastic. Okay, Stefan, you're next. Great, thanks. Uh, I wanted to, in doing this, respond to one of the questions here, which was that, should we give up on human beings? Uh, and I think the, you know, the answer to give up on the human species, and I, I think the answer to that is that, you know, First of all, one of the things this has demonstrated is how incredibly adaptable human beings are. 
many of us churned for the first few weeks and we now are in a, we've changed our lives completely. And I, I think we should uh, remember that. And I think also, uh, apart from some of the protests in some of the state capitals, this has been an incredibly peaceful period of time as well. And so it really speaks to the ability of humans to respond to a crisis in a pro-social way. So I, I want to, I guess, you know, I'll just say one thing that I hope that we learn from this. Inequality is costly. Uh, I saw a video the other day of a young, uh, an African-American worker in a grocery store who has not paid sick leave and had to go, has to go to work during this crisis. And she, I think the name of the video was, do you want me serving you during this COVID crisis? And, uh, you know, the reality is that we are all in this together. And I hope that that becomes much more apparent, that inequality is not something that any of us can actually fully isolate ourselves from. And I want to link this to climate change. Inequality is deeply responsible for the lack of response to climate change, not because poor people aren't responding, but because the wealthy have the resources to block scientific research, to uh, mount political actions that discourage response to it. So I'm hoping that we, un we have a, we will, at, at the GUND in particular, have a greater understanding of the relationship between inequality and climate change, but more generally, human health, uh, both mental and physical, is, is fundamentally related to the people that we have ignored and marginalized for many, many years. Okay, Brendan. So, yeah, I was just going to say that um, in one of my classes, we've been going over the, the kind of the science of happiness. And um, when we look at like the key indicators or the key drivers of, of an individual's happiness, there are things like community, family, health, as we've just heard a few times mentioned, um, and having, you know, in being employed and having a stable financial situation. Um, and if I feel like a lot of the work and a lot of the effort we, we engage in around the world might not be in service to those pretty simple things. And a lot of those things that bring us happiness and how we find community, et cetera, don't have a huge um, an eco footprint. And so my hope through all this is that there is this reorientation, this focus on the things that actually bring us um, happiness or bring us um, contentedness. And as Meredith mentioned, um, food, we're all cooking more now and maybe that's a good thing, maybe that's not, at least here in the US. Um, our community, our neighbors reaching out to some of our elderly um, friends and family. And those things are actually delivering bumps to our well-being and to our happiness. And the hope is that this crisis allows us to realize that a lot of those things that drive happiness can be achieved pretty low cost and with, um, without a huge environmental impact. Okay, Luce. Um, one thing that um, I would love to to come out of, to come out of this um, is a better appreciation of our impact on the environment and how our health is so deeply interconnected with the health of the environment. Um, COVID nineteen is not the only pandemic that has risen from or has emerged because of. Um, bushmeat uh, consumption or wildlife hunting. Um, there are many other pandemics that, that have emerged because of this and because of other forms in which we, that, that we interact with the environment. So hopefully that's uh, um, something that comes out of it. Okay, everybody. So we are four or five minutes over, so I'm gonna wrap it up. Um, there. I just want to say a few quick kind of reminders. First of all, thanks so much to all of our panelists and to John for that just amazing summary on the fly. Uh, secondly, sorry to people who asked a lot of great questions that we didn't have time to get to. I see uh, panelists continuing to type furiously to get some of them answered. And again, we'll save them before we shut this down so that can continue. Um, and I really hope, one thing I hope comes out of this in a narrow sense about our own community is that it has prompted um, some ideas and sparked some collaboration ideas among some of us um, that we can pursue in the future. This is uh, um, a time to really think about 
how the social environmental system has um, contributed to the uh, the currents of this pandemic, but also contributed to how we responded and who has suffered more than others. And I think that we can take a lot of cues from that, do what we do, um, some scholarship to understand uh, those dynamics so that we can help prevent them in the future. So I'm hoping really very fervently that people follow up from this, don't just um, uh, hang up and go on to their lives, but really think about what we could do in the longer term. So. Thanks very much again to the speakers. Thanks for the almost 200 people that tuned in. Um, I hope everybody's staying safe and healthy. And again, even though we're on Zoom, we are all in this together. So it was good to connect with so many of you. That wraps this up. Thanks very much again and have a great rest of your day, everybody. Thanks, Taylor. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.